top business stories live from the Sky News City studio. Three of the most senior executives at Boeing are to leave as the aircraft manufacturer seeks to resolve the safety issues that have engulfed it. UK government sells its controlling stake in NatWest for the first time since the old Royal Bank of Scotland was bailed out 16 years ago. And venture capital firm Impact X seeks to raise £100 million for underrepresented entrepreneurs. We'll speak to its co-founder and chief executive. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. Three of the most senior executives at Boeing are to leave after the aircraft manufacturer became engulfed in a row over its production standards. Gary Kellner, the chairman, won't stand for re-election, while Dave Calhoun, the chief executive, will step down at the end of the year. And Stan Deal, who runs Boeing's commercial aircraft business, will lead at once. Well, the US Federal Aviation Authority recently ordered an audit of assembly lines at a Boeing factory near Seattle. It follows the blowout of a door panel on an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 jet in January. Here's what Mr Calhoun told our sister channel CNBC earlier today. We have another mountain to climb. Uh, I, let's not avoid what happened with Alaska Air. Let's not avoid the call for action. Let's not avoid the changes that we have to make in our factory. Let's not avoid the need to slow down a bit and let the supply chain catch up. Um, we got to get at that, just like we got at the rest. And we will get through that. We will get through that. And I've committed myself to the board to do exactly that. Well, joining me now is the aviation analyst, Sally Gethin. Sally, welcome to you. Uh, this is a huge reset by the Boeing board. Will it be enough to regain the confidence of investors? Uh, well, it's a step in the right direction, but it's not very reassuring the staggered timings of this. So Dave Calhoun isn't leaving till the end of the year. And uh, he was saying we there, the collective we, about the, the whole of the aircraft um, company. But really, um, it won't be a collective we. Um, uh, fairly soon. So we've got a sort of chop and change uh, mechanism going on. One or two, uh, so Stan Deal is leaving right away, but uh, uh, Dave Calhoun, who's the one the finger of blame is pointed to the most, is, is just going to carry on almost like a lame duck CEO till the end of the year. Yeah, good dis description, that. I mean, uh, worth reminding viewers, he is the second Boeing CEO to lose his job over slipshod production standards. Yeah, so prior to him was Dennis Moylenberg, who, if you as remember, um, unfortunately presided over those catastrophic incidents with the Boeing 737 MAX back in 2018 and 2019, massive loss of life, huge controversy, brought the whole of the aviation industry into disrepute, quite frankly. And a lot of the fine words that are being said now by the CEO, Dave Calhoun, were said by his predecessor, Dennis Muhlenberg. And, and here we are yet again. And luckily, there hasn't been a loss of life over recent incidents, um, including that very worrying incident with Alaska Airlines in January. But, but it's really not looking good because the scrutiny is the regulator went into the company, found so many issues with quality control on the assembly floor at Boeing that, that really the whole of the company is under investigation. I mean, Sally, this is kind of emblematic, really, of the sort of long-term deep-seated decline at Boeing, which has seen it overtaken by Airbus. If you had to summarise it, where would you say things started to go wrong? I think really things, like I said before, uh, became very evident with those crashes. But really the culture started to change. Boeing used to be known as a very pioneer pioneering aviation-led firm with a lot of aerospace engineers. Safety took precedence. It was very obvious. The pioneering spirit, you know, um, a, a fantastic reputation. And then it, the, the, the top level of management started to change more towards these finance corporate um, uh, type of executives and the shift in the priorities started to change and really it's been a slow decay since then. So I, I don't see how it's going to be a quick fix to, uh, for this problem. They're, they're, they're making the right noises, uh, they're bringing more women into the upper level of management as well. Um, so we, we have to wait and see but, but you know it's going to be a long slow climb upwards. Well, you mentioned women coming into the uh, management. Obviously, Stephanie Pope is central to that. She's taking over from Stan Deal in the uh, commercial airlines business. This is a, her second battlefield promotion in as many months. I mean, if we'd been sitting here a while ago, we'd have said she was Calhoun's likeliest successor. Do you think that's still the case or do you think they might go outside? Yeah, I mean, it is possible. You know, she is being um, tipped to be... 
um, his successor. Um, I think they have to be very careful because if they go outside the company to p pick somebody who's, uh, you know, a captain of industry in a different sector, then in a way they end up with the same issue. Somebody who is not born and bred and, and breathes the air of aviation and aerospace. And in a way, they need to get back to that, perhaps get back to basics rather than, you know, rinse and repeat with very corporate types at the top. OK, Sally, we've got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the UK government is no longer the controlling shareholder of NatWest for the first time since the old Royal Bank of Scotland was bailed out in 2008. Well, that left the government holding 84% of the bank, but today it's emerged that that has fallen to 29.8% following a sale of shares on Friday. The government made clear a while ago it aims to exit its stake in NatWest altogether by 2025, 26. Well, joining me now is Michael Brown, Chief Investment Officer at Martin Curry. Michael, good to see you this afternoon. How significant a moment is this, do you feel? Well, we know the placing is coming. It's been well signalled. And this, of course, opens up the opportunity to do it when market conditions are just right. Interesting to do it just before Easter. That's normally quite a quiet time. So I would imagine the investment banks have all been rung up and asked, when are we going to make this placing? And to be honest with you, it's going to be quite an interesting placing. Mm. So, I mean, the government obviously is committed to this sort of British gas-style retail offering for, yeah. for, for small investors. Does that make sense? I mean, it's not the, the most efficient way of uh, offloading stake. No, it's not. But, in you know, we've, we've sat here and we've talked about the lack of interest in the UK market and how the UK pension funds have been um, talked to by Jeremy Hunt et al about how they've been reducing from the market. This is an opportunity to get the ordinary person investing back in UK equities with a company that may not be the most exciting company in the world, it may not be the most, you know, best publicity company in the world, but, goodness, it's very cheap, it's going to give you a yield of 7%, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, is that the investment case, though, just the yield, or is there more to it than that? I think also there's that recovery in the UK PLC, which, again, you know, we've been talking about for a while, that as that goes through in 24, as that goes through in 25, loan losses are a little bit lower, you're going to see a little bit pick up in, in, in lending over that period, continue to be decent, decent cost awareness, I won't say cutting, but mm. cost awareness in the business, and therefore you get, what, 6 7% this year, 7 8% next year, maybe a, a special and some buybacks the year after, you're running yield starts to look pretty interesting over a three-year period. Yeah, that's a good point. Better than cash. Better than... Well, what isn't these days? <laughs> <laughs> um, what about uh, the, the uh, likely appetite for this, though? I mean, is this going to get people going in the way that the old British telecom and British gas privatisations did? Oh, it's tough. That, that's, a, that's a tough one, because obviously a very, very different era. We're not in the early 80s, and we're certainly not calling up Sid or anybody else of that, that name at this point in time. But... but uh, yes, I think it is an opportunity to do two things. One is, as I said, build confidence that actually UK PLC is worth investing in. And secondly, it kind of draws a final historical line under the GFC. Mm. That's it. It's done. We've finished that particular chapter of economic history and we need to move on to another one. And I should remind everybody that actually there's a huge level of savings that were built up in covid is still there, it's still in the piggy bank, so people will be looking to do something, although the travel industry thinks that everyone's going on holiday. Yes, that's right. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, we were around, obviously, the pair of us in 2008. Yeah. I mean, if someone had said to you back then, this thing's going to remain in government ownership all the way out to 2024, what would you have said? Uh, I would worry about its solvency, but to be fair... You know, the three CEOs since then haven't done a bad job in turning this business around and bringing it back as a sensible, well-organised company as opposed to the extraordinary collection of acquisitions it was in 2008, many of which were not very good. This is very true. Michael, we'll be seeing you later on for the market slot. Thank, Thank you. you. Some other business news stories for you now. And the European Commission said today its antitrust regulators have begun investigating the US tech giants Alphabet, Apple and Meta for possible breaches of its new Digital Markets Act, which came into effect earlier this month. The investigation will cover whether Alphabet, the owner of Google and Apple, allowed developers to steer users away from their app stores. It will also look into whether Meta, the owner of Facebook and WhatsApp, gives sufficient choice to users over the use of their personal data for advertising purposes. It's also looking into whether Amazon is giving preference to its own brand products on the Amazon store. 
Europe's biggest do-it-yourself retailer has warned on its profit outlook for the first time in six months. Kingfisher, which owns B&Q and Screwfix, said it was cautious on the overall market outlook given the lag between housing demand and home improvement demand. The company, which also has market-leading positions in France and Poland, was reporting a pre-tax profit of £475 million for the year to the end of January. That was down 22% on the previous 12 months. And shares of Mobico, the renamed National Express, slumped by more than 7% this morning after the company said profits for the year would be lower than expected and announced a further delay to publication of its annual results. The company, which runs bus, coach and rail services across the UK, North America, continental Europe, North Africa and the Middle East, blamed accounting issues in its business in Germany, where it operates three railway lines in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia. It now expects underlying profits this year to be between 160 and 100 175 million pounds down from previous guidance of between 175 to 185 million pounds. Now, the venture capital firm Impact X, which looks to back startups founded by underrepresented entrepreneurs, has today, said today it's looking to raise £100 million for its second fund, and it already has a key investment from Bank of America. Impact X, whose founders include Seleni Henry and Ursula Burns, the former CEO of Xerox and the first black woman to head a Fortune 500 company, said investment has also been secured from the Visa Foundation, the Guys and St Thomas's Foundation, and from Atomico, one of Europe's leading tech investors. Well, with me now is Eric Collins. He's chief executive and founding partner of Impact X. Uh, Eric, welcome back to the programme. It's good to see you. Um, for viewers unfamiliar with what you do, what was the impetus for setting up Impact X in the first place? So, Ian, thank you for having me again. It's good seeing you. Impact X is like most other venture capital firms. We believe that there is a great deal of return, which is possible if you're investing in the right innovators. We believe the right innovators exist in the UK and Europe, and that they are functioning in the digital and technology space, health, education, well-being, and media and entertainment. We also believe that there is a market inefficiency. So capital is not going to women and people of color. If you look at women across the, across the region, only 3% goes to women-led funds. Only 1% goes to minority-led companies. So because of that, we think that there's actually a market inefficiency and we can get a differentiated deal flow which allows us to get very good returns and allows us to be able to also deliver on a second thing, and that is to make sure that we are creating good jobs. How's the first fund uh, fed? The first fund, fund, uh, the first fund fared very well. Thank you for asking. We had a number of luminaries in that fund. One is the InsureTech um, unicorn here in the UK called Marshmallow. Marshmallow. Yeah. We've had them on the program. And when we invest in them, a 30 million pre-money valuation, 18 months later, 1.2 billion. That's a, that's a sensational story. Raylo is another in the circular economy that's here. They raised 136 million last year in terrible conditions for fundraising. And then we have a Welsh company. And that Welsh company's name, Health and Her, which is looking at perimenopause and menopausal health, 10,000 retail outlets in the UK and in the United States. Those are the sort of metrics that when you're looking at underrepresented entrepreneurs, women and people of color, you find that you're able to get returns that are very, very competitive. So you're looking to raise 100 million pounds. How mm -hmm. much will you typically deploy per investment? We, well, with the help of organizations like Bank of America, with the help of organizations like the Visa Foundation, Guys in St. Thomas's and Atomico, we're able to have more capital to invest. In fact, we're looking for more capital to invest in these organizations. So we believe that those organizations signal to their peers that this is a great place to be and that they have found something that is a great and important way to invest. We generally are investing up to $5 million per company. That is our, and our sweet spot is really companies that have had product market fit so we love to see companies that have made a million pounds. And many people might say that underrepresented organizations and entrepreneurs in Europe and the UK are doing that. Lots of them are doing that. And so we find ourselves a good differentiated deal flow. So you're looking to invest largely at the sort of late seed series A stage. Why that part in a company's lifestyle in particular? You know, for us, it's very clear at that point sort of whether you have an, a horse that can run. If you're looking for returns, you're not looking necessarily for um, just to do something with your money, but you actually are looking for real returns that are quantifiable, and then you can return capital to your investors. If you're looking a little bit later in the process, that lets you, to, and in the investment cycle, that allows you to actually have more 
time to actually develop more good companies and less time to get returns. So we find that that's exactly the space where it makes sense. And often we find women and people of color find it hard to get that secondary institutional check. And so for us, it also gives us a good set of opportunities. And obviously, uh, most VCs will offer a lot of mentoring to uh, founders. Presumably, you'll be doing a lot of that as well. We spend a good deal of time on value add. When you have people like Lenny Henry, you have people like Ursula Burns, who are your board, and Rick Lewis, who runs you know, a 20 billion um, pound uh, private equity firm here in the UK, and you have those sort of people who are actually investors as well as advisors, you have a certain differentiated approach to value addition. And that value addition is something which we are very unique in providing to other people who are women and people of color. Because if you'll notice, all of those names are people of color and or women. I note uh, you've also uh, identified the first investment opportunity for this fund. We have. So we've actually made some investments up until now. In fact, today I was an investment committee. We, we approved four more investments. So we're, in, we're deploying capital relatively quickly because the demand is high. We've actually deployed in one organization, which is in the net zero um, building space, and they are called Inoa. They're a UK company. A US company that's an AI company that's in the creator economy called Bump, I like that name. We have some others that are actually out there, Data Technics up in Manchester. So as you see geographically, we have sort of spread around ourselves a little bit in terms of where we're focusing. Although we are really focused primarily on the UK and Europe, we also spend a bit of time looking opportunistically at the United States and elsewhere. Great stuff. Well, Eric, best of luck with that. Come back and see us again soon. Thanks, Thanks for joining me. Good seeing you. Still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets are doing this Monday afternoon. Stay with us. I'm Mark Stone and I'm Sky's correspondent based here in Washington, D.C. Wall Street! Well, the plan seems to be to head to the police station where the policeman who fired the shots was based. And everything you know is memories is all gone. In almost every corner, this town has been completely destroyed by the fire. I've witnessed the remarkable passion for politics here, but the anger too. We have to get Trump out of the White House. Is this the moment to reform gun laws? You know, it's, it's easy to go to politics. But it's important. It's at the heart of the issue. I, I get that that's where the media likes to go. No, it's not. It's where many of the people we've talked to here like to go. I report on the biggest stories from around the world. This is a town that is effectively encircled by the Russians. You say it's all fabrication, what's happening in Butcher. Destroyed my nation. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our planet. Oh, yeah, I can hear now quite a few explosions uh, in the distance here in Jerusalem. A very violent series of confrontations here. What do you think of ISIS? Everybody here know the truth of ISIS.
If you forgot your pajamas, Emirates has got you covered. Fly Emirates, fly better. Well, in Europe, uh, stocks have had a largely uh, positive session. It was a bit of a soggy start to the morning, but uh, here's the situation at the close. Uh, the um, yellow leader jersey there grabbed by the MIB in Milan, up uh, nearly nine-tenths of 1% there. It's going to be a shortened week, obviously, this week due to the uh, Easter weekend. Talking points today in mainland Europe include the Swedish property group, SBB. It's risen by 11% in Stockholm after announcing it's buying back a big chunk of its debt at a 60% discount. Well, here in London, here's how the FTSE 100 has uh, finished. Uh, nearly a fifth of 1% off, uh, better than it was earlier on in the session. Uh, pretty broad-based sell-off there. The leading blue-chip faller today is the engineer Spirax Sarko. That's fallen by... Uh, just under 4.5% there. There's a bit of adverse broker comment kicking around last week. The leading blue chip gainer, very interesting one. If you're watching our morning programme, you'll have seen me talking about Kingfisher, which was getting smacked first thing. It's actually finished up 2.5% higher. Outside the FTSE 100, the insurer direct line has slumped by uh, just over 11 and a quarter of a cent. That's after its Belgian rival Aegeus abandoned a proposed takeover after the market closed on Friday night. Outside the FTSE 100, well, the leading mid-cap gainer is the aggregates producer Breeden. That one's up 2% on positive broker comment. Over on Wall Street, well, it's open to the downside, but Boeing is up by uh, more than 1.5% now on that boardroom clear-out, while the sporting and outdoor goods maker Vista Outdoor is up 1.5% after a would-be buyer raised its terms. On the foreign exchange market, Sterling has clawed back some of last week's losses. Uh, the pound currently ahead by uh, just under a third of 1% against the dollar, up a sixth of 1% against the euro. Good day for the single currency. Likewise, up more than a quarter of 1% against the greenback. As for the oil price, well, that has rallied this afternoon following uh, the sell-off at the end of last week. Barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $86.74 a barrel. That's up 1.5%. Well, with me again now is Michael Brown, Chief Investment Officer at Marcin Curry. Michael, good to see you again. Um, Kingfisher, what on earth happened there today? Most shorted stock in the FTSE, so that's a big reason. But actually, guess what? Things are getting better. So the, the statement and the feeling around it is, guess people are going to go into the shops this weekend, in particular with Easter, buy a few things, do a bit of DIY, get the house going again. Yeah, I mean, Kingfisher... I mean, this is, this is the weekend for DIY oh, this absolutely. week. Absolutely. I mean, the weather's not looking great, the forecast. Which is OK for DIY as long as you're indoors. I mean, preferably, if you want your garden furniture and you want your garden mower, that's what you need the good weather for. But I would suggest that after a period of hibernation from the UK <laughs> consumer, having got a few increases in, in pay, and don't forget there's a 10% increase in minimum pay coming in in a, in a month's time, people are feeling just a bit more optimistic. You think so? Ah, uh, looks like it to me. And the other point is that we're seeing the housing market and the RIC surveys, they're beginning to squeeze as well. So you're getting this broad information from the building and construction area and Breeden's again and the yeah. same story. Things are beginning to turn here and I believe it as well. And that's also true of the equity market. I mean, what a week last week. You know, Wall Street, all three indices uh, hit record highs. The Nikkei in Tokyo. And the dear old FTSE's only one and a half percentage points off its all-time high. So we've, we've done quite a lot of work on this. And, yes, absolutely, best to travel before you arrive in terms of interest rate cuts. Markets do quieten down a bit after the first rate cut and there will be a kind of, oh, how many will there be? Will it happen for very long? And then, of course, you get the, oh, look, the economy's doing better and off it goes again. And yet... If someone had said to you at the beginning of the year that all the three of the magnificent seven, which drove most of late last year's recovery, would fall in this quarter and that the Fed wouldn't have cut interest rates, I mean, this was the point Goldman Sachs would be making today, you'd have said, well, hang on, the market's probably going to fall. And yet well, 
And, and, and I think that's Goldman Sachs with a bit of hyperbole on that basis, <laughs> OK? Because, one, the evidence is better just because the Fed is late to the party. Remember that it takes nine months from the f last rate rise to the first rate cut. In other words, the Fed's always late to rise and therefore goes, oops, and nine months later and, and, and changes its view. On the other side, those three of the Magnificent Seven, they've all been hit by various stock-specific issues, something that we were talking about, that the real interest is in one place, but the breadth of those, those other three you should be careful about, and we don't own them. What are your, what are your thoughts, very briefly, Michael, on the, the timing of the first rate cut? For me, June, at, by the end of the second quarter, I think Europe will be well into it. I think we've got a rate cut coming from the Bank of England. By then, I'd be amazed if we don't. They're going to be under horrible pressure. Inflation's going under two and staying there for the rest of the year. The Fed might demure a fraction because the growth rate in the States is a little bit better, but not by long. All right. Well, we shall see. Michael, always good to see you. Thanks for joining me today. That's it from me. I'm back with Business Live tomorrow morning at half past 11. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up next, it's the News Hour with Jonathan Samuels. Thanks for joining me today. Cheerio.